I'm so honoured and, and, and glad to be here. Um, when I got the email, I was actually quite shocked um, that I was going to India. Um, and here I am. Um, my name's Yinka Lori. Um, I'm an artist based in London. And what I do is tell stories through furniture. Um, these are stories from Nigeria. Um, and the parables are really thought-provoking because they talk about love, sexuality, hope, um, freedom. Um, and it really, for me, parables that my parents told us, told, told to me and my family when we were kids. This parable here, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Is an African parable. And for me, it kind of sums up my family and the kind of estate that I grew up in, in, um, in North London. This is a council estate. It's called Essex Road. Um, it didn't look as pretty as this illustration. It was really uh, dark and raw and quite aggressive. Um, lots of crime, drug dealing, and all sorts of kind of negative things were going on there. But what I loved about this estate was that we were all one family. So you have people from Ghana, uh, Nigeria, India, Kenya, Syria alone. It was so multicultural. This is my, uh, my mum and my, my dad and my siblings. Um, and what was special here was that we always had parties in, my, in our estates. It was a small estate, but we had a party probably every weekend. Like, it was a Nigerian party, live music, um, lots of Nigerian food, jollof rice, chicken, everything in, this, uh, in my household. This is my grandma in 2002, my late grandmother. Um, and as a kid, I always kind of struggled between sort of knowing am I British or am I Nigerian? I loved being British, and I also loved being Nigerian, but I always felt my British culture kind of always overpowered my Nigerian culture. And also with things like the press, the press always kind of portray Nigeria in a really sort of negative line, like corruption and crime and all these negative things. And I was like, surely there must be something beautiful about Nigeria. So I went to Nigeria when I was about 11 or 12 years old with my family. And I was amazed by how much culture there was in Nigeria. The amazing fabrics, the food, the narratives, for me, was mind-blowing. And I was just like, wow, like this is what I've been missing out on. I was always really immersed by Nigerian music from like Fela Kuti to King Sonyade, and these musicians always sang, you know, in parables. So it wasn't just music. If you listen to the words deeply and, and, and slowly, there's always a narrative in there. But as a kid, I hated Nigerian music. I thought this is a load of rubbish. Um, but then as an adult, I actually understood why my parents were really playing this to us every weekend and, and, and Christmas and Easter. So Nigerian parables. Here's one parable about a fool of a man. It's again, it's quite an inspiring parable about, you know, sort of not giving up, being strong and kind of keep keeping yourself going. Um, there's one about, you know, but at the end of, uh, again, another parable. Again, another traditional Nigerian parable. And these are parables I've kind of used in my work. Um, and for me, I always thought I had that there was a struggle between a cultural gap, sort of knowing if I'm Nigerian or if I'm British. And what I've done was basically, it kind of started with parables. Going to Lagos, Nigeria for the first time at 11 or 12, and speaking to my grandparents, my family and cousins, and working out what it is to be Nigerian. Why are my parents so proud of wearing, you know, Swiss voile lace? Why do they wear colours? And why are they so, why are they always so happy? Um, and if you're a British person living in Nigeria and you wear, you know, you wear your Swiss voile lace, you wear your kind of colourful clothes, people sometimes laugh at you or sometimes think you're crazy. Why are you wearing this, this you know, this Dutch box print which is from, which is from the Switzerland, but you're wearing it in Nigeria. So what I've done basically was I started researching these parables and wanted to kind of tell the narratives into, into furniture. So the word that I created became very much sculptural. Um, and these, these, these kind of parables in these chairs were looking at hope, again, sexuality, um, the idea we can you know, have in two cultures is not a bad thing, it's actually a positive thing. This piece here is called Ewa, which is called Beauty. Um, this piece on the right here is called Oshimaru, which is Rainbow. And this piece on the left here is called Let There Be Light. And this piece actually was um, acquired by the uh, Vitra Design Museum. It's now gone on tour. It's gone to like, the Guggenheim, Vitra Design Museum, it's gone to Bilbao. Um, it's actually part of a show called Make in Africa. This is it in, in, in the exhibition and in my studio. So what I've done, I was basically wrote a proposal to the British Council. I wanted to go back to Nigeria and actually do some work in Lagos because I kind of felt like I owed Lagos my kind of my narrative and my culture because I've taken so much from, from Nigeria. So what I did, I did my first kind of exhibition in, in Lagos, Nigeria, because it's called, this is where it started, because for me, this is where my kind of heritage started. Um, 
And these were the parables I wanted to look at. The elephant weeps like in the teeth, the wild boar picks the ground with them. No matter how bad a child is, you cannot give it out to the, to the leopard. So again, I did, you did an installation, worked with local, local craftsmen in Nigeria, um, and we created it. It was, it was a kind of an interactive installation. Um, because we had live talking drummers, told parables through the drumming, through the music. Um, and yeah, for me, it was, you know, it, it, it was special because I had my family down, my grandmother was there, my, my uh, granddad was there, uh, my family was there as well. And just sort of giving back to my, my culture, my community thing was really special. So that was, for me, really important. So a recent project I've won in London is um, a project with uh, Wandsworth Council. Um, it was also in collaboration with LFA. Um, it was called Happy Street. Um, and it was a competition which was, for me, my kind of first public room project, the biggest project I actually I will be doing in my career. Um, it's worth a lot of money. I'm really nervous and scared. Um, but the fact that I won the project, I'm actually just so grateful and overwhelmed. Um, so there was a competition to re, sort of revisualize this bridge in Battersea. Um, it's really dark and dingy, it's horrible, it's scary, and lots of crime in, in, in that particular community. So I submitted the proposal. Um, this is the bridge at the moment. Uh, so if you, I mean, as you can see, it's really horrible, it's dark, it's dingy, it doesn't look really safe. Um, and there's a school just actually behind uh, the railway underpass. Um, so what we've done basically, we sort of brought this, this proposal, this, this sort of tender, and the, the schools had a chance to kind of bid and vote for each proposal. And there was also a few judges uh, who had to also vote for the winning proposal. So this, was my, uh, this is my image for Happy Street, which will be opening, sort of be happening next year, June. Um, it, for me, it's quite a special project because it's uh, allowed me to kind of create and do what I actually believe in, you know, use color as a kind of catalyst to tell stories. Um, and I feel like London can be quite a dark and kind of dull place. There isn't enough color in London. We need more of color in London. And being in India, the houses are colorful, like people are so, like it's, it's incredible. I'm really inspired actually um, by a lot of things I've seen here. This is, that, this is actually the underpass. So it's like, it's, it's a color heaven. It's just pretty much color in the whole space. And it's basically looking at how, you know, how color can promote well-being um, in, in a space and in a community. Um, so that's, that will be happening next year in collaboration with the London Place of Architecture in June. So if you're in London, please visit Happy Street. Um, another project that I've been working on in, in London is called Color Palace. It's with, uh, it's, quite, it's actually quite a big project and quite respected in London. Um, every year, the Dulwich Picture Gallery asks architects and designers to design a pavilion um, in Dulwich. Um, I worked with architects called Price Gore. They're based in Peckham. And they came to me, so they were, basically these guys designed my studio in Harrow. And they came to my studio, saw my space, and loved what they'd seen in my studio. It was really colorful, and there was chairs all over the place. And they said, hi, Yinka, work on a project for Dulwich Pitch Gallery. Do we want to collaborate? Would you be interested? So I said, yes. So the theme for the project basically was called Color Palace. We were looking at Lagos. You know, this is, this is Lagos, Nigeria. It's a market it's called Balongo Market. And what was quite interesting was sort of how they used this kind of Dutch wax print to sort of create this kind of hive or this kind of hut, which is quite interesting. So that was part of our inspiration. Also, going in Nigeria, sort of this north of Nigeria, the Aousa uh, tribe, um, and how they kind of used, you know, colors and patterns to sort of design the facade of a building. Um, again, really for me, was quite really inspiring. These are kind of early sketches from the, for the Color Palace. And this is the Color Palace, which is going to be, uh, be, which will be next year, June, um, in Dulwich Picture Gallery. So if you know Dulwich, it's, it's a predominantly a middle-class white area. Um, there isn't any color in Dulwich, um, and it's very kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a posh area. So having this in Dulwich is going to be interesting to see next year. Um, and for me, that was a culture gap because I'm, I'm bringing Lagos to a middle-class area, and I'm talking about Nigeria and Lagos and, and my culture and celebrating it, um, which is going to be really exciting. And then there was, there's been a few kind of con controversial emails we've had in from local residents in Dulwich who are not really happy about the Color Palace. Um, but, you know, if, we're, if, if these emails are happening, it's always a good thing. You know, it's always a kind of good conversation. So if you're in London again, please come and visit Color Palace Open next year, June. So this year I was invited to um, design a library for the museum, of, a phonographic museum in Sweden. Um, and I was very much inspired by Nigerian masquerades. Masquerades you would see in Burkina Faso. Some masquerades are kind of, you know, performed for like spiritual weddings or um, some of them sort of, you know, have this kind of, some of them have positive powers and some of them have negative powers. 
Um, so this was again the, the colors, the kind of shapes. Um, I wanted to kind of incorporate into the space as well. This is again another mass grade from Burkina Faso as well. Um, I find the colors quite interesting, the kind of the, the fabrics, the materials, composition. Um, for me, I want to try and incorporate into the work as well. And if you, if you know about architecture in Burkina Faso, for me, like, what I love about the buildings here is how raw they are. The colors are not the unapologetic, you know, the, the kind of textures, the shapes. Um, and it, and, and that it's, you know, it's Africa, it's, you know, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and this is a mosque, again, in, in, in Burkina Faso. So seeing so much color and so much shape and being sort of influenced, inspired by, you know, the kind of narratives and, and, and cultures that I'd, you know, seen in, from this sort of Pinterest and mood that I created, um, this is the dialogue space that I created for the Ethnographic Museum. So the Ethnographic Museum is based in Sweden, Stockholm. They have over like, I think over like 40,000 objects that no one's ever seen before. So they will now be able to kind of, you know, there was, you know, again, introduce like new objects into space, new exhibitions and new ideas. Um, this is for their objects. So for me, trying to, my gap here would be the culture gap and sort of understanding how to bridge these cultures together and how can I celebrate these cultures together and how can I, you know, how can someone who is, again, who lives in London, who is in London, who is from India or wherever they're from, how can they not be ashamed of their culture? Because for me, I was not always proud to be African. I was always like, I'm Jamaican or I'm from the Caribbean. Never, oh, I'm Nigerian. But it took me, you know, sort of being about 13 or 14 years old said, you know what, I'm African and I'm proud of my culture and I want to celebrate it. And this, is the best, this, was the, this has been the best way for me to celebrate my culture, through the colour, through you know, storytelling and, and, and through, you know, uh, through my language. So I was invited by um, Life Water, who owned Pepsi, uh, um, to, you know, to, to create some artwork for, one, for a bottle that they were creating. So they worked with quite a few artists in London and, and New York. Um, and this is a, a piece I created for them, which is a, a, a piece of artwork that basically celebrates culture and it's to do with love and hope. Um, I mean, you know, they've been really supportive in, in, in my studio and we've gone to, we've done shows in like Miami and, and Art Basel and, and we're doing Freeze Art Fair in London this year. We're doing like Q&A with um, some other artists who are also, you know, part of this project. Um, I was also asked by Adidas this year to create um, some furniture um, for the World Cup. Um, they would be working with Adidas, you know, Adidas, they work with a company called Parley. So Parley recycle, they work with recycled plastics and create yarns, create t-shirts and trainers and that kind of thing. So we were told to, you know, to sort of, you know, be inspired by this project and sort of be inspired by what Parley are doing with Adidas and how can we kind of, what would be, our, what would be, what would be my take, um, you know, on, on, on furniture. So I worked with a company called Durat. So, so Durat, sort of, you know, work with industrial plastics and basically what they do is they try and create sheets of plastic out of it. So what I've done here was you know, I created this, um, this bench for Adidas and it was sat on by a few, uh, yeah, Storms is, you know, responsible for Adidas. So Storms is sat on it, as, on, sat on the chair as well. Um, he, he played football as well. Um, so yes, this was a project for Adidas. Again, just kind of, you know, trying to, th th there's a lot of consumers and, and massive brands that actually always understand the, the, their audience. Um, and for me, that was, a, that was for me quite a big gap, an interesting gap, to try, you know, to try and fill. So we were approached uh, by Unilever. So Unilever, they own things like Dove and Prairie Liquid, and they own pretty much everything, I think. I don't know, yeah. Um, so we were asked to, you know, to sort of create our own kind of pot noodle, but an African version of pot noodle. Um, and then we called it, it was called Red Red. So we had like yams and lentils and uh, jollof rice, which tasted all right. It's not like, it's not like, you're not like your mum's cooking. Um, but imagine pot noodle, kind of African version in a, in a pot with hot water and you can sort of eat it if you're in a studio, wherever you are. So that was, that was pot noodle. Um, so again, working with you know, such a big company like Unilever um, and you know, trying to sort of you know, fill that gap, understanding that gap as well, how can we incorporate you know, the kind of, you know, this kind of British Nigerian heritage in London and fuse it into a, you know, into, into, into a small pot? And what does it look like? We were then asked you know, to create a pop-up shop, um, this kind of sort of pop-up for, for Red Red. Um, and for me, we again looked at sort of, you know, sort of the Nigerian kind of culture and sort of how they construct things, how they design things, what kind of raw materials they use. Because what I love about Nigeria is that they really know how to utilize you know, things that are around them and create objects and seeds and So things like bricks and kind of you know, tubing um, is really uh, part of our heritage. I mean, they know how to recycle. 
So one of the, one of my biggest and successful projects was a project with Citizen and Hotels in Shoreditch. Um, and this was very much inspired by my playground in, 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 in North London. Um, grew up in a really sort of rough estate uh, that wasn't, the, the, the council didn't really sort of take much care at all to the people and its environment. Um, but for me, I loved my playground. I loved the how it was. I loved that we played together. You could be black, white, Asian. Did not really cared what religion you were. We were kids, we played. And I think that's missing a lot now, especially in London. It's either you're Muslim or you're Christian or you're black, you're white. And that, that negativity for me is it, it, it's, it's sad. And I think it's lack of education. So for me, I wanted to celebrate my upbringing and celebrate my culture and celebrate my upbringing. So what I did was um, I created a, sh a, a, play a playground. I sort of redid my playground in my vision and how I saw my playground in North London. And for me, this is how I saw my, my estate playground. I saw it was colourful, interactive, um, and it was during London Design Festival last year in, in uh, East London. I also had a hotel, which was quite funny because what was funny was that the hotel sort of cornered off this playground, which was meant to be interactive and playful, and told guests they can't you know, go on a slide or use it. It was pretty bizarre. Um, and surprisingly, if you know Shoreditch really well, this playground last, lasted the whole duration of, of LDF and nothing was damaged. So that was interesting. This is a few installation shots. And then it actually got donated onto um, uh, Bow Arts. So it's actually, also with LDF, there's lots of kind of things that are made and then thrown away and wasted. Um, but this was actually, you now we gave it to a school in, in, in uh, well, a, a company called Bow Arts. And now they have a freaking fly running around. For me, a project I did in London, which was quite special, was called Restoration Station. Um, and for me, I think it's definitely a generation gap. Um, and what I do see a lot of in London is that people make mistakes. You know, I've got friends who've been in the system for all sorts of things. And I think as a society, we always judge people and we don't give them another chance or allow them to kind of be, you know, get back into, you know, into, into society. Um, so I was commissioned by uh, LDF last year to do Project Restoration Station. They're based in Shoreditch. Um, they're a charity that work with ex-addicts, so drug addicts and... and, and um, alcoholics, and what they do is they kind of teach them how to upcycle furniture. So I'm kind of giving them my skills, and they're going to use my skills that I've taught them and use it into society. So we did a workshop, worked with about around 10 addicts. We did a workshop, and um, we created these chairs with them. Um, and these chairs got so much press from our decorations, the world of interiors, uh, the Evening Standard. Um, such a you know heartfelt and incredible, incredible project, giving back to the community. The community. I feel a lot of designers don't give back to their community. We, we, we just take, 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 take. How about, you know, we try and give back, you know, help someone else, help the community um, and share our skills. Um, yeah, for me, it's really important. So these chairs were auctioned off um, on the opening of the exhibition and the money raised went back to the charity. So, yeah, that was for me was, was a really special project. So another project that I was commissioned to do last year was, was with Now Gallery. And I was told, I, was, I kind of wanted to host a design salon. Um, for me, I got quite tired of London because we're meant to be a melting pot of culture, multicultural, but it doesn't reflect in its design scene. I can't see, I'm, I, can, I can count how many designers in London who were black. I can count my fingers. And we have so much culture in London. And how can we count like one black designer or two black designers? I, that's, that's quite bad. So I wanted to try and host a design salon in London um, and, you know, like get people from fashion in to like from interiors and illustrators and, and, and furniture makers and, and try and have a conversation about this. So this was a design salon I heard. It was basically we had like food and drink and we sort of had a discussion um, about how can we reflect in you know, London's multiculturalism in design. Because every year in London, it's the same designers, the same artists, the same speakers doing the same, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not evolving. We, we at least reflect you know, London's, London's, you know, culture of melting pot. Um, year before, the year before that, I was asked by Milton Keynes Art Centre um, to, uh, yeah, just do a project. Um, and what I wanted to do, my, my parents always told us as kids, you know, no matter what you do, always treat people good because of tomorrow. And they said, even if we're not alive and we're dead, we know we've given you, given you this legacy to treat your neighbor as you wouldn't be treated. And it's always stuck with me. 
Um, and my parents are, you know, very, they're very prayerful. They pray 24 hours. They're always praying. They love church. They're, you know, very religious. Um, so what I did here was I created an installation. That, um, basically, you sort of step into the space. Um, on one side, you have, you know, you have, you have quite a few chairs. On the other side, you sort of get, do this good deed, and you go on the other side, you, there are like more chairs. So the chairs, for me, is a kind of catalyst and metaphor here. So the idea you do good, and then tomorrow, you're going to reap and do, you're going to get more good, because you've kind of left that, you've laid down that legacy. So for me, when I try and create work, I try and leave a message behind it. The work is always quite humorous and really sort of funny, but if you kind of always dig deep, there's a message behind um, the narrative. For me, this again, I'm really, for me, part of this whole narrative is, is, is culture gaps, because this is, for me, the biggest part of my practice. Um, my favorite project that I did was actually called uh, If Chess Could Talk, and that was in the shop at Bluebird in Chelsea and Kings Road. And for me, this project here kind of gave me my career. It kind of allowed me to get into, get into the industry, because it was the first time I was kind of proud of my culture, not scared to tell the narrative my way, because I can't, t I can't, I can't tell your story. Only you can tell your story your own way, because you've seen that story through your own lens. So I can't tell you how you grew up or how I grew up, because I haven't been, I haven't been in your shoes. So when I tell narratives of my work, is I tell stories that are real and things that I've seen. It's not, they're not fake. They're not, it's, it's, it's as real as it gets. So for me, this is, this is the life gap, um, if chess could talk. No matter how long the neck of a draft is, it still can't see the future. So it, you know, it, it sounds funny, but if, we, if you dig deep in this narrative, there's so many sort of themes you know, in, this, in this message. Um, and for me, what I take out of this is that you know, we should never judge anyone because tomorrow you could be CEO of Microsoft, you know, CEO of Apple. I don't know your destiny tomorrow. No one knows my destiny. You know? And that's the beauty of these, of these parables. So I went to a school in North London called St. Alan, which is an all-boys school. Um, and the, the chair on the, on the left there is called Backbone. The one in the middle is called Flowerbone. The one on the right is called Captain Hook. And all these chairs have narratives um, and stories. The chair on the right um, is called uh, a trapped star. Um, and I looked at a young person in my school, who, there was two brothers. The older brother was a drug dealer, uh, not a good role model at all. Younger brother, really talented, so intelligent, but wanted to be like his brother, because that was the cool thing to be. So he was kind of stuck between these two kind of cultures. Do I be good or do I be bad? I'm, I'm just really stuck. Sadly, he ended up going to prison, just like his brother, and he was always trapped between these kind of two chairs. So, if you see here, there's, that, there's, there's a, a really, really kind of big captain's chair. And if you look at the black and white lines, that's actually a small kid's chair. So it's two chairs into one. That piece is now actually in a um, Brighton Museum. So it's been acquired by the uh, collectors there. So it sits alongside chairs like uh, Salvador Dali, um, Charles and Ray Ames, and people that I looked up to as a kid. So I mean, that, for me, that was, yeah, uh, pretty, pretty major. Um, and I'm, yeah, still kind of pinching myself over it. Um, a final project that I worked on was for, for Clarkenmore, London. This was the familiar religious gap. So my parents were always praying, always. I'm like, why are they always praying? I don't understand what you're praying for. I can't see God. Like, what, what, what is it? Why, why are you praying? Like, you've, you've got candle work, you're praying to this candle. Always praying. Um, but what I understood now is that they, always, they did it for us. It was, they did it for us. I made to make sure that we you know, had a good life. We were always safe. Um, and I remember as a kid, my parents always go to, they'd go to Margate to pray. So they'd be at Margate, praying by the seaside, praying to God they can't even see. But what was amazing was that people would pray for, you know, to pray to, pray to have children. They would pray to have their different, you know, pray to have their visa stamped. Or they would pray for a wife. Or pray to have, they would pray for anything. And I would see people, you know, every Sunday going to the Margate, praying by the sea, you know, dipping in their toes, or even kind of bathing in the water on in, in the seaside. Um, and then there was one woman who wanted, who wanted to have children. And she prayed for about, I think she was for about 30 days. 30 days of praying, 30 days of fasting. And God answered her prayer. She had twins. That was like, she could, they told her she couldn't conceive. And she had, she had twins. Um, so for me, that, that is a testimony, a testimony in itself. So what I wanted to do was try to sort of tell the narrative of all these all individual people um, through this installation here. Um, and that's what I've done here. This is the installation last year. Thank you very much. That's it.